Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to a new semester. Yay. This is the first of the semester of the Biology and Society Conversation Series. And they're developed in connection with the Life Science Ethics Program that Karen Ellison runs. And Linda is handing out a form to sign in a questionnaire. Um, the Life Science Ethics Program is trying to get information on how best to develop programming for the future, that kind of thing. So um, as in the course of things, uh, jot down comments. And then at the end, drop those off, please. So I actually am most excited about this. I shouldn't say that. Or, you know, we're supposed to be good parents, like, oh, all the kids are equally good. But <laughs> this is my special favorite event, because these are two of my young friends and colleagues from the Marine Biological Laboratory. And Kate McCord is the, well, she's an ASU graduate, so she did her PhD here. And she gave her uh, dissertation defense in this room, which was packed, because a class told all of its people to come. And, that, and I was like, in the history of the universe, the most people attending a dissertation defense. So, so Kate then went on to the MBL, where she is the lead on a project that we all three work on related to regeneration, so the regeneration project. And you'll hear more about that. And then at the MBL, we were, after Kate was there, we were lucky because Duigu came. So Duigu Uspalat, whose name I can never say quite with the right accent because I'm not the right linguist. But OK. Anyway, um, Duigu came as a Hibbit Fellow, which is a very prestigious and competitive fellowship program there. And she actually tomorrow will be speaking in this room from 9 to 11 about a little more about her research as well as career paths and doing things in a slightly abnormal but extremely interesting way. So she has worked with a variety of colleagues. But the reason these two are especially exciting as a team for me to work with and learn from is that they challenge each other. So Kate has a background in sciences, but then got her degree in history and philosophy of science. Duigu has a rich background in kind of liberal arts and sciences generally, but is now a developmental biologist. And the two have different assumptions about things and about how you should work in the world and how you should think about topics like germline and germline regeneration. And so what does history and philosophy of science have to say to scientists? And how can scientists show that historians and philosophers can get a little arrogant in our interpretations and maybe need a corrective based on what the science is actually doing? So these two will each tell us a bit about their work, uh, their work together. And then what we want to do is kind of push them to learn more about what they have learned by virtue of working together. The MBL and having this combination and ASU School of Life Sciences, where history and philosophy of science is embedded in the School of Life Sciences, are two of the very few places that actually make this kind of conversation possible and encourage it and believe that it's a good thing. So here we are. So take it away. Thank you, Jane, for this wonderful introduction. Um, so what Kate and I thought about doing is, uh, first, I'll give you an introduction to the biological question. And then Kate will take over and um, she'll talk about more of the history and uh, philosophy side of things. Uh, but at any point while we are um, presenting, please uh, feel free to s stop us and ask questions too if there's something that's not clear. We just want to be you know, all on the same page about definitions with all of you. And then um, after that, we're going to have uh, the full-blown discussion, we hope. All right, so let's see. I'm going to do this with this hand. All right. Um, and then still learning this. OK. So one of the most important things an animal is going to have to do is to reproduce, is to make more of itself from a biological uh, evolutionary standpoint. Um, and in order to do this, uh, most animals use uh, a process called sexual reproduction. Um, and 
they undergo, well, they have to go through a lot of trouble like this uh, peacock spider is doing. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so they need to come up with elaborate colors or behaviors to attract mate. Um, this is a peacock spider and this is a bird of paradise that's making a weird dance uh, to attract mate. Um, and then some animals don't have this kind of behavior, but they, they need to spawn in the ocean, basically releasing all of their um, eggs and sperm and hoping that they are gonna meet somewhere and make uh, successful progeny. So these are sea urchins that uh, spawn, and then these are corals um, that release sperm and egg into the ocean. But before you even get here, um, as an animal, what you need to do is to make the cells that will uh, make reproduction happen, that is the sperm and the egg. Um, so first you need to set up, establish a germline, is what we call, this is a uh, disgusting fly that has these beautiful ovaries inside. So I think it's, I, I love this because when I found these ovaries in this fly, I was um, at a deep level uh, affected by this. So I was just telling Kate that this is something you would want to kill, but here it is. It's got um, a beautiful structure inside. Um, and these are thousands of eggs that it um, set up during its development um, as a separate cell lineage is how we see things right now in biology. And so basically, um, the way the current understanding of this, uh, the animal biology is there are two fundamental cell types in um, animals. One is the germline, which uh, is the lineage of cells that lead to the reproductive cells, and then the other is the soma. So um, throughout this uh, conversation today, we're gonna keep talking about the germline, and germline means, or we may say germ cells or reproductive cells, and that means um, the sperm and egg, but also any cell type that leads up to that um, point, such as primordial germ cells and germline stem cells, which is not important, but basically the point is that um, it's this lineage that gets set aside in the embryo that is dedicated to reproduction. That's how we, the general view um, is currently. And then anything else is called the soma. So that's all the cell types like muscle, nerves, um, epithelial cells that do not become the next generation. Um, and a lot of the times people will talk about the soma as being the mere carrier of the germ cells from one generation to the next, but they don't get to survive um, beyond that one generation. All right, so, so basically that means germline gets segregated from soma, and um, usually this is depicted as this, that like you have the soma on one side early on in development and then germ cells, and then this cycle goes on, whereas these cells never make it to this side of the, um, barrier, which we will talk about. Yeah, so the, there, there is a historical reason for um, what I've just shown you. That, and Kate will talk about this more, so I'm just gonna skip these. Uh, but basically, you have, this, you have this Weissman barrier where somatic cells are not able to, it's a barrier that somatic cells cannot cross and become germ cells. Um, and this idea, even though it goes back to 1800s, um, it's been around for a long time now, uh, and basically it's been supported by all the, oh, there it is, okay. So if you um, kill the germ cells somehow how experimentally or um, due to some disastrous thing, uh, the organism can't replace them because of this barrier, right? Uh, because the soma cannot cross this and make germ cells. And so this whole idea was supported by all the research that's been done on a handful of number of animals, um, like Drosophila or nematode worms, um, within the last century. Uh, because when you look at these animals, what you see is there is a segregated germline. And then um, if you remove that germ, germline lineage, they become infertile. So they cannot replace them. So it all supported this view. And so this is what we see, for example, if you look at um, a fruit fly's development, you have this, this set of cells that express a marker gene that's, that we call a germline marker. 
in this case, Vasa. And this gene is not expressed anywhere else in the early, at least at this stage. And these are the cells that become uh, gradually the reproductive cells in the embryo. Uh, and this is true for the nematodes. There are um, these two early cells that express, again, a particular germline marker. Um, and again, if you remove those, the animal is not able to replace them. And the same is true for uh, the frogs. So you, can, you again have a group of cells that get segregated. Um, they tend to also migrate from one place to the other, um, which is a germline thing to do. Um, but basically they express all these, um, sorry, all these markers and then um, they become the dedicated lineage. So there are two things. One, um, they express certain markers that we thought are specific to the germ cells. And then two, if they are removed, they can't be replaced, right? But as we look at different organisms that are not within these um, very uh, heavily used model organisms, such as an annelid worm here, so we see that they express these germline specific markers in their germline, but then also we see these markers in somatic cells. So it, it, what that means is really like what we thought about th being specific to the germ cells is actually not specific in some animals. Um, and that's true in a lot of different animals. This is a uh, comb jelly that's expressing supposedly germline specific markers in its somatic tissues and then a sea urchin larva, if you injure its somatic tissues, those cells that normally don't express these germline markers start expressing them. And then finally, um, there are some animals that actually regenerate their germ cells. So again, unlike these uh, model organisms that can't replace their germ cells, there are animals that actually can do this. So this is a hypothetical animal that has uh, reproductive organs on one side of its body. And if you cut it in half, um, it's gonna, these two halves will have different problems to solve. This one is purely, um, we could argue, somatic, but then this one has somatic and germline uh, cells, right? So what this one is gonna have to do is to replace both somatic and germ cells, and then this one only needs to replace uh, soma. So it looks like in some animals, well, there are a lot of animals that can do this, first of all, but then in some animals, this um, the soma is able to give rise to the germ, and this germ cell soma distinction doesn't appear to be as strict as uh, we came to believe. So this is one example. Um, this is Siona, it's a tunicate, and this is the larval phase, and it has these cells here that I just marked, um, but there are these cells um, that will later make the germ cell, uh, the reproductive cells. So this is the germ line. If you cut this larval tail, um, these larvae actually don't die, they survive, and then they end up giving rise to perfectly fertile adults. <laughs> so we don't know um, how the process exactly happens, but what we do know from experiments that people have done is these, um, these are coming from a somatic lineage because they carry the somatic mutations uh, that people, the researchers introduced into the animal. So basically this is a somatic to germ transition and it's an example and that means again that it's, this barrier isn't really holding up uh, as we thought it should. Okay, so then this is my final slide. This just shows some other animal groups that do this. So it's actually really widespread, much more widespread than we thought it is. And with this, um, if you have questions, you can ask me now, or I'm going to um, switch to Kate. All good? Yes? OK. Oh, I have my own mic. Does this work? Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so Duigu just gave a great introduction to the biology. Thank you, because it makes it a lot easier to talk about history and philosophy when you have a really nice introduction to the biology. So let's take a look. So there's some claims that I want to make about how doing history and philosophy can actually help current science, how we can actually help to transform science. One of them is that 
doing history and philosophy really helps to expose and then challenge assumptions. So this is what Jane was talking about when she introduced us. And that's kind of what I do at the Marine Biological Laboratory with Duigu. And the second one is once we get to the point where we find these assumptions and we're challenging them, you can use history and philosophy to begin to frame answers to those assumptions, to those challenges. So when it comes to germline, there's a number of assumptions that we could talk about, but there's three in particular that I find very interesting. So the first is the relationship between germ and soma. So this is what Duigu was talking about. When she was telling us about that barrier, about how soma cannot cross that barrier to become germline, she's talking about the way we think of the relationship between these two kinds of cells. The second was what she was talking about with Vasa and Piwi, and she showed us that analid that's expressing it throughout its soma as well, is this notion of germline identification. The methods that we use to identify germ cells might not be as specific as we thought, and that's a huge assumption to have when you're trying to do research specifically on the germline. And the third is the acquisition of germline identity. So I'm going to come back to this in a little while, um, and hopefully it'll become a little bit clearer by the end of this talk. So just briefly, I'm going to follow this relationship between germ and soma and tell you a little bit about the history and then a little bit about how we use philosophy to actually help advance our understanding of this problem. So this is a schematic of essentially what we understand the relationship between germ and soma to be. You've got, you start off with germline that gives rise to the rest of the body. You get to get to the next generation, you need germline. So each of these would be considered a generation. So you've got three generations here. The relationship that the Weismann barrier, which is what Duigu was talking about, tells us is there's a very strict relationship between germ and soma. So that germ can give rise to soma, but soma cannot give rise to germ. And this is the key point here. Soma cannot become part of your germline. But we have evidence that, you know, maybe that's not the case. But why do we think this? Well, Duigu gave you a brief introduction to the history. We think this because in the 19th century, people were trying to come up with all sorts of ways to understand how heredity works. And I do not have time to go into the full history of it, but know that this is an incredibly long and incredibly synthetic book that outlines that relationship. Weismann, for whom the barrier is named, that barrier between germ and soma, he did a ton of work to the point where germline biologists today are still citing him, and they're still citing him as coming up with this notion of that barrier between germ and soma, as defining that relationship as completely inviolable. So as Duda told you, this is how we think of germline biology today, but it didn't have to be that way, right? Science overturns things all the time, and in fact, not everybody has agreed with Weismann over the years. So these folks are really well, they've written some really well-received textbooks on how germline works. And you don't have to read this quote, but what they're saying is we need to think of the germline not as a different kind of cell, not as something separate and distinct from soma, but as just another case of differentiation. And a case of differentiation in which you've got the, the developmental potentials preserved. So they're saying it's probably not separate and distinct. We probably don't need to have this barrier. So there's actually, throughout the 20th century, after Weismann, there's been pushback. But that pushback hasn't been recognized very much. We still have that Weismannian idea. OK. So Duigu was talking about regeneration of the germline and how if you truly think that the germline is inviolable, if you cannot have so much a germ transitions, germline regeneration is going to be really difficult, right? Now, if we're thinking about germline regeneration, you have to think, well, if you're going to regenerate those cells, where, where are they coming from? What is the source? So we have three hypothetical scenarios. So this is where philosophy starts to help out thinking about how do you solve that problem between, between these two kinds of cells and that relationship between them. So you could have lineage restriction, right? So this is what the, the Weismann barrier would tell us, that the only way you're getting germline back after you've removed it is if some of it is left there. Otherwise, it's not regenerating. Here's another scenario. This would be a pluripotent cell, like a stem cell, that could give rise to both soma and germ. That wouldn't necessarily violate the Weismann barrier, 
But it's something that the Weismann barrier doesn't really take into account. And then this, you would have to have soma dedifferentiate and then redifferentiate to become part of the germline. So this is transdifferentiation. This is a somatic cell changing its identity and becoming part of the germline. According to the Weismann barrier, that doesn't happen. According to the evidence Dewey who showed you, this does happen. So if we look at this, transdifferentiation completely violates that notion, that relationship between germ and soma that germline biology really rests on. And we have good evidence for that. But what are the implications? So history and philosophy isn't just about how did we get to this point and then how do we work our way out of the assumptions. It can also help us think of, well, what are the implications of the work we're doing? What are the implications of having germline and soma separate? and not thinking about, well, they might not be so separate. What are the implications of having a viable uh, Weismann barrier? So here's the Weismann barrier again. And remember, this relationship is the key. Soma cannot become germ according to the Weismann barrier, according to most of germline biology. But we saw that it can in certain instances, in that Siona example. So let's say that Soma can become germ. Let's say that we're doing genome editing on somatic cells, and you introduce an edit into a somatic cell. Well, if you've got transdifferentiation, that could get into your germline, which means that it can become part of progeny. It can become part of future generations. So if the relationship between germ and soma isn't as set as we are led to believe, if this is an assumption that does not always hold up, which is what we're arguing, there could be real world implications for all sorts of things, including somatic cell genome editing, because it might not be as different from germline genome editing as we think it is. OK, so an unresolved question here is really about germline identity, right? So I'm talking about the relationship between these two kinds of cells and saying, OK, these are two lineages. Can one become the other? The answer is, in some cases, yes. One question that follows from that is, how, how on earth can a somatic cell become a germline cell? So the question here is really one of, how can a cell acquire germline identity, if that's possible? And then if it can, what are the conditions? So this is where we're using philosophy to sort of parse these problems into manageable chunks. So things that you can do, and these are things that Duigu does. You do cell lineage tracing to say, OK, we've got germline. Well, where are all the cells coming from that are going into the germline during regeneration? This is work in her lab. And then germline regeneration, as she said, look at animals that bring their germlines back once they've been removed. And look at animals that are your non-canonical organisms. So not just Drosophila, not just C. elegans, not just Xenopus. You need to look throughout the metazoans at anything that creates a germline and say, what are the conditions under which soma can become germ? And is it the case that it can? So this is also work from Dewey Goose Lab. And with that, I really want to open up discussions um, and have the audience be involved. Um, and we can talk about germline. We can talk about collaborations across disciplines. We can talk about pretty much anything you guys want. JJ? Um, so how do you, how do you know, can you tell me, can you walk through how you know that these are somatic cells okay. that are producing germ lines rather than somatic cell that can turn into a point? It's not a cell on the end. It's turned into a thing. So the question is, if I and please correct if I'm wrong, um, you're asking how the somatic, how do we know the somatic cells are turning into germ cells, and what? Rather than like some leftover stem, stem cells, cells or yeah. induced 
or right. over mm -hmm. the, yeah so I this is a great question and I think we need so much more data in a lot of animals to know the exact answer and we need to do um, genetic lineage tracing which basically will um, in, introduce labels to different cell lineages in animals uh, in, an, in an individual right and then let's say, I mean, I always think about it in terms of colors. Like, let's say you uh, color one lineage with blue and then the other one is red and so on. And then the germ lineage is green. And so if you can manage removing all the green uh, from the animal experimentally and then show that red ones are making the germ now, um, you, could, you could argue this, right? So I think what looks like is happening in Siona, the tunica example I gave with the larval tail having the, the germline is that, but the problem is it's not fully investigated, right? Like we don't know if these animals actually have some um, pluripotent cells that are coming from the same germ lineage. So then like we can't really differentiate, but it looks like um, at least in Siona, when they introduce a label to the muscle, they actually find the muscle label in the germ cells that are regenerated. So there is some good evidence that at least some somatic lineages are turning into the germ cells in that organism, for example. Do you want to? Well, okay. Um, so if the, one of the things that Kate said was, hey, maybe this means that if we're editing somatic cells, they might, you know, from, they might be heritable. Um, is there a kind of thing? So you say we've got a tag in the muscles, and that tag shows up. But is there any is there any evidence that changes to the somatic cells? Are those things are heritable, or is there some things that aren't? Right, because Kate's saying something like, hey, if we make a, a difference to these somatic cells, and somatic cells can give rise to uh, germ cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the question, then maybe that's heritable, but the question is, is, is that heritable, or are they just producing germline cells? Oh, like they are actually normally producing germ germline cells without any. If a somatic cell could be changed and then give rise to a germline cell, does it look different than the germline cell that gave rise to the somatic cell? Does that difference in the somatic cell become a difference in the germline cell? You mean, has the gene edit made it into the germline? Yeah. Yeah, is the gene edit right. actually heritable, or is it just that the somatic cell that has been coincidentally <laughs> edited can also give rise to? So, like, I guess if, if I answer with the Siona, and then if you have if you yes. have anything yeah. to add, you yeah. can. So, in the case of Siona, what happened is they found the somatic labels in the next generation. So that means that these somatic cells, or at least somatic lineages that ha had the label, somehow gave rise to the germline in the individual, and then once that individual mated. It, its progeny included the, these specific mm -hmm. labels that were in the somatic lineages. So yes, those somatic cells are able to make functional germ cells. Yeah. Uh, it, it, does that answer your question? Is that what you were sort of getting at, I guess? I mean, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe it seems like maybe those labels are created in order to be preserved. I mean, just if it, if the, like a trait is uh, edited and, in a yeah. somatic cell, is that going to give rise to a germ cell that's going to Okay, so I should clarify that this is a label that you introduce into the genome. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like a dye, right? Like I should have made that more clear. So like what, what that means is you are basically permanently changing that cell's genome that is heritable. Yeah, it's not going to revert. It's a heritable label that you're introducing. Yeah. Yes, you were first. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first would be, <laughs> is there a working theory why... Uh, this phenomenon shows up in some species as opposed to <laughs> all different types of species. And then the second would be, what's the frequency of this phenomenon happening in, say, Siona? Does it happen every time that you cut out the germline cells, will you see uh, the soma cells <clears throat> regenerating as germline cells? So, uh, 
I'd love some NIH funding to <laughs> answer these questions. I think we just need to look more because we haven't enough, we haven't looked into enough um, families of animals to, you know, have any idea about what's most common. And maybe the Siona example is a weird, like, uh, rare case. And maybe what more, most... Uh, commonly what happens is that you have a specified lineage that's dormant that you don't see that's g still germline and then that's you know only in that situation you can uh, regenerate the germ cells so I think it's too early to talk about any kind of generalization because we haven't looked enough um, but what obviously one um, necessity here is that you need to be able to somehow regenerate or reprogram your cells so uh, in the case of nematodes like C. elegans, those are very poor um, or no regenerating animals, so they can't do it, right? So there, there are some things we can say about it, but we can't really say much about how they do this um, and how common any of these uh, cell type, you know, the, mm -hmm. the one that Kate showed, like lineage restricted versus soma, soma giving rise to germ cells. Uh, what was your second question? Oh, in Siona. So with Siona, there's really good evidence that you don't even need to remove the germline. So you know how Duigu showed they cut off the tails to get rid of those germline cells? You don't have to remove those cells, and Siona will still convert soma into germ. And they told that exactly the same way by looking at the markers, the genetic uh, changes that they had introduced into these different cell lineages. And even when they weren't experimentally messed with, you still had those somatic markers getting into the, the germline, which is a pretty good indicator that Siona's germline is pretty permeable to change. Now, the extent to which you could continually do this, like you could continually experiment on like the same organism and it will continually give you germline out of soma, that has not been examined, um, and it would be it would be tricky to do that one. And so. One thing that this indicates is actually we look at this organism, Siona, and we use these germline markers, and I'm going to quote them, put them in quotes uh, because they are not really specific germline markers. And we see these two cells, or later they will become more cells, express the marker, and we're like, aha, uh -huh, those are going to make the germ cells. I don't know what's going on. Um, and then we, don't, we stop looking. Because yeah. at that point, we we're like, oh, okay, th this makes sense. This is pretty straightforward. Those are making the germ cells. But probably what's happening is there are some other lineages that were originally uh, categorized as somatic that are able to, yeah. just like without any human <laughs> interruption, are able to make germ cells. Yeah, so that's one of that's a huge assumption that exists in the field is once you've identified those cells early on, that those actually become the only cells that will give rise to your germline. Without a really detailed cell lineage, you can't definitively say that. And there aren't that many really detailed cell lineages that don't just use things like the markers Dewey was talking about to mark them as germ cells. So can you comment on the process? Uh, in Sion, are we still talking? Okay. Um, I actually uh, don't know, don't work on Siona, so I don't know enough about the entire process. But what I do know is once you um, cut the larval tail off, the tail never regenerates. So the animals actually just survive that process. And then nobody has looked in between, like, what's going on. Um, but early on at the stages that normally they should show Vasa staining um, in their primordial germ cells, they don't show it anymore. But somehow those um, manipulated larvae end up becoming fertile adults. So what's going on in between, nobody knows yet. I don't know why people are studying this. I think this is one of those things that I feel like if I had more time or a clone of myself, I'd want to study it, yeah. Yes. Ah. Well, that's an interesting question. 
what the the biggest use immediately would probably be for infertility treatments. Um, and a lot of the research that is done for human infertility treatments is done on human embryonic stem cells or reprogrammed um, stem cells. So that could absolutely be used yeah, if if you figured out all of the pathways and could safely regenerate uh, human germline. Um, but. Yeah, it, it's, it's just really tricky to get the kind of data you need from humans, right? <laughs> I mean, you can do plenty of in vitro work, and you're working on cells that you have induced to have a lineage that looks like germline. You usually don't work directly on germline cells. Um, but you can't do in vivo work. You can't look at the germline in vivo and how it's interacting with the soma without having some ethical issues, I would say. <laughs> so so it's, it's tricky. You need to use different types of models, like primates. And mouse, it turns out, is not the best way to model humans, which is shocking to probably a lot of people in this room, I know. Um, but yeah, like getting direct access to the kind of information you want is very difficult. Indirect access is already happening. I guess the idea would be to utilize these created germline It makes sense, um, but at the same time, I think what most of the stem cell, uh, human stem cell field is trying to focus on right now is to do that through maybe less steps, mm -hmm. because this ends up introducing so many more steps, um, as opposed to like if you could just take any somatic cell and then reprogram it into whatever cell type you want, that's a much more direct way of doing it. But it's it doesn't mean that it's, you know, it won't be useful. What you say could be used for studying some of the molecular pathways, but like Kate is saying, it's not going to be, it's going to be in vitro, but that's what you do with human uh, <laughs> cell research, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I was just wondering if there's species that you've studied it. Like, I think it's interesting with the Siona example, or like also uh, like jellies, for instance, because these are things that can like asexually reproduce, or <laughs> that have these like very distinct transitions from larva to adults where we know that they're like completely changing in that part of the stage. Yeah. So there are examples first like in species that don't kind of undergo those types of changes and then secondly um, in terms of like you're talking about the implications then of passing these things on to me the implications if, for like kind of what infinity was talking about using humans is really different than like potential implications for like pathogens or for crop species or like these kind of other things that maybe like there's differences between inducing this change purposefully from soma to germline in terms of implications and then like what are the implications of us genetically modifying organisms and those modifications being passed down right and so have you like thought about the implications on either side of that so, so why don't you answer the asexual okay. part, and then we'll get back to the implications, yeah. All right, so yes, I, this, so there are some animals that um, go through many cycles of asexual reproduction, agametic asexual reproduction, which means that they don't use any gametes, right, they just bud, they make a new clone of themselves by... Um, forming a bud and then that grows into a new individual or they already sometimes like just bud off a fully ma mature looking um, individual in the worms that I study. And in this case, yes, there's so now there's no establishment of germline, right? Like and um, what we know in a lot of these animals is they are able to then go on to become sexually mature. So that means they are somehow either inheriting a germ lineage from the um, parent, or they are reestablishing it um, on their own. But there is very little known about this too. I think this is a very interesting question. And I usually get into this in like longer seminars. Um, it's something that I would love to do in terms of, you know, again, genetically labeling cells in one uh, individual and then following up in the 
asexually produced individuals, how, where do those germ cells come from? Right. And then could you clarify what you're asking about implications, please? Um, <laughs> so, like, you talked about the implication of, like, for humans who have infertility, right? If you take some of the cells and yeah. sterling, that, that implication is, like, very clear to me. But the other thing that kind of pops into my head is, like, in an age when we genetic, genetically modify a lot of organisms, mm -hmm. and basically this plasma barrier we used to assume applied to all organisms, and now what we're finding, like regardless of what the implications are for humans, is that it doesn't apply to all organisms, then it could mean that things that we are like introducing into species, thinking that we're introducing, or into individuals, thinking that it will only affect the individual, could be passed down. Mm -hmm. um, like, are there any interesting kind of implications around that in terms of like some of these species that are more similar to Siona, or I, I think of like lateral chain transfer of bacteria and stuff, as Another example, like where it could have implications for human health or agriculture. Or so are you essentially asking for other implications if there are so much germ transitions? Yeah. Okay. Well, and if we can induce them, which is a big jump, right? Well. And the fact that they exist and the fact that we could then just yeah. engineer them whenever we want is really a different thing. Right. <laughs> um, so, well, actually, if we could induce them or if they're naturally occurring, right? So what I'm trying to say with the slide um, about the, the genome editing is that if it is a naturally occurring event, which it seems to be the case in Siona, but maybe we're talking about humans now, if we are developing uh, technologies or protocols that have something to do with disease treatment, for instance, and we're doing that for somatic cells on the assumption that whatever we change in the genome of these somatic cells will just stay in that individual, that could be a faulty assumption. And that could be a faulty assumption with consequences for generations, right? And maybe, maybe, maybe some of it is like something we could give a pass to. Like maybe we could give a pass to using this to cure cystic fibrosis, which would be a really weird way of doing it to do somatic genome edits, right? But okay, let's say cystic fibrosis. It's a, sim it's a point mutation. It would be relatively simple. This would be something maybe we want to get rid of. But if we think of something like cancers, where you want to target like one gene. So one of the, the cancers I like to talk about as an example is, is basically tumor genesis, where some of the therapies you're trying to target a gene that deals with the immune system. So the, the gene that codes for PD-1 protein. It's a cell surface protein. And actually in clinical trials now, they're trying to edit somatic cells so that you suppress the expression of this gene so that you can get rid of this PD-1 protein for the duration of this cancer treatment. Right. Right? So you're trying to shrink the tumors. Now if that edit gets into the germline, you will have progeny that is severely immunocompromised because that gene helps set up your immune system. So that could be a huge problem, right? And we need to think about this. We need to think about what we do and do not know about the germline and about how it is part of the body and may well interact with other cells more than we have thought it does before we can start to say somatic cell uh, genome editing is safe and you know we can do it as long as we think about the implications of like off-point mutations or something. There's other things out there for somatic cell genome editing that could be problematic and this could be one of them. Yes, Jane? If you were in charge of the universe... Go on. I'm very interested now. <laughs> well, it's about textbook, so it's hard. Oh. But yeah, how would you change the textbook? So you're, I mean, I... When you started raising this, I, <laughs> I looked at all my pile of biology, yeah. biology textbooks, and you're right. They all have this big, fat barrier yeah. there, as if it is a truth. So, but, but do we go, you're yeah. saying, wait, we don't know enough. We, yeah. So are we going to be wimpy and say, well, you know, that might not be true. You know, that's really old. You <laughs> think it might be different. Or do we just say, Wait, in some cases, that's just false. I mean, how would you fix the textbooks? So Kate talked about Newcoop and Stasuria's um, books. These Very are just good books. I, I read them on weekends. It's like, I just, 
<laughs> we should be teaching. Uh, they are old, but they they are just so comprehensive, and they raised all these things that we are also raising. And mm. um, Cassandra Extor certainly has been writing a lot about this. I don't understand actually why this isn't making it yeah. into textbooks because it's. Um, and my biggest guess is we are still very much uh, model organism dominated in. Mm-hmm. Um, in biology, and these are these like weird minority <laughs> animals, I, and that's probably why. And I I agree that we you're making me think that I should probably take or we both should a more <laughs> proactive approach and write to uh, t- textbook writers and um, yeah yeah we yeah. can we can write to Scott yeah. Scott Gilbert he he's the one who's authored many of these developmental biology textbooks Jane's talking about yeah. yes. You guys haven't found every single species that this had this uh, somatic determinant line. <laughs> but like, is there anything in common like between those species that this does happen in? Like, does this only show up in the species that can like regenerate, you know, a whole half of their body or something like that, or undergo like ma- you know massive changes from like or just like m- massive like metamorphosis where they just completely change their entire body, like, or has it been found in, like, vertebrates or mammals or, like, so it, there's a, I don't think you have it. I had the uh, phylogeny slide. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So I guess the, the problem with answering this question is because we don't know enough about what's going on, I guess, um, what are we exactly answering, right? We don't know if... So we know that all of these organisms I show here and some more that I, I don't have uh, mapped on this phylogeny, they somehow replace their reproductive organs or reproductive cells. But what we don't know is that if they are crossing the Weissman barrier, right? So, so if we're just talking about are they able to replace um, the lost reproductive cells and organs, it's everywhere, <laughs> and even you could argue that in vitro we're able to now take somatic cells from mice and turn them into completely functional gametes. So, at least in vitro we're able to do that, right? So there are um, situations where people remove um, gonads from salmon and they they grew their gonads back. So there's there's some like fisheries reports. Um, so it's not a just invertebrate thing, right? Okay. Uh, something that's not an amazing regenerator is still able to do that. And in fact, this is not published, but um, our director, Nipon Patel, has some work on a crustacean, which is terrible at regenerating. I don't yeah. think it regenerates anything normally. <laughs> but what, when they go into the embryo and they ablate the cell that normally gives rise to the germline, um, these individuals, again, later on, they are able to replace their germline from previously somatic lineages. So it doesn't look like being able to good at regeneration is a prerequisite, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It, Does this yeah. only happen early in life, or can it happen to an adult within itself as well? Yes, it can happen. So early in life, obviously, a cruel scientist needs to go in and <laughs> make the <laughs> cruel experiments on the animal, probably. Um, but later in life, like a in, in worm uh, can mm-hmm. get it's one part of uh, body bit off. And some of these worms regenerate from a small piece, a complete new individual, right? Mm-hmm. So um, it can happen as an adult. Yeah. Um, so it seems to be pretty... Um, and I think it doesn't surprise me that it happens early in the embryo in some ways because we always consider em- embryos more plastic. Um, but yeah, it's not a life stage uh, limitation either. I don't know who was. Um, I think Beckett. Um, I'm curious, what is the reception you've been getting from biologists about the merit of investing more in the sorts of research that you've been wanting to do? Are they saying like, oh yes, this you finally like? I didn't realize we had these assumptions. This needs a lot more support. Mm-hmm. Or are they still saying like, yeah, you haven't proven it yet. I'm not moved to, you know, get off my chair and vote in your favor. What what are the, the the pushback or support you've been getting. So I just submitted an NIH grant. 
<laughs> email me in March and I'll tell you <laughs> what's going on. But I think, so there's some good um, change in NIH uh, where at least the general medicine um, is moving towards finding more weird animals. Uh, it's still not an easy world out there for those of us who have, you know, I mean, my organism has transgenesis and a lot of tools established, but even then it's not a drosophila, right? Like it's, um, so I think it's still a little harder to convince because of the technical reasons, um, but I'm hopeful. I think at least I'm hopeful that I may get good uh, reviews this time and then maybe get funded next year. But I, there are people who got funded with sort of, sim not the idea, the topic, but similar organisms. Um, I think a lot of the times if we have time like this to discuss um, in length, people understand the um, importance of it. But there is also a lot of that like, well, germline doesn't regenerate or like germline is immortal. You know, there's mm -hmm. these like very weird romantic <laughs> ideas about germline that we're having a hard time even like the most germ cell expert is, uh, they are just so dedicated into this line of thinking that um, yeah. it hasn't gone into like, oh, we're not going to give you funding, but we have this one article that we have trouble publishing because I think, I don't know. <laughs> uh, because the editor of the special section is one of the people who's been promoting germline is immortal. And we have a whole argument about how this doesn't make any sense. Um, so it wasn't that popular with the editor. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine. Yeah. But it'll go somewhere else and it'll be okay. <laughs> JJ? Okay, so then we'll have somebody else. Um, yes? So do you think like the evolutionary aspect was missing from like the original theories? Right? So if we take like an evolutionary perspective, like it might make sense to like we had to remove germline, that somatic cells could theoretically become germline. Right, in terms of like reproductive success and making sure mm. that's a possibility. So, so like, what do you think huh. is missing from those original theories huh. that could have like really just shed perfect. light like early on, right? So, like interdisciplinary with our thinking. That is a great question. I can tell you, Weismann was extremely interdisciplinary. He was an extremely synthetic thinker, and actually, a lot of the reason that he came up with this notion of a distinction is because of evolution. So what Weismann was trying to do was say, how do I get a line of cells that can give rise to a whole new generation, but I don't want to allow the inheritance of acquired characteristics, right? So anything that affects the soma, okay, that'll stay off in this organism and die with them. And if it's distinct and separate and they cannot cross over, then any mutation in the germline, okay, like that can pass on. That is the basis for evolution. But he's using this to deny the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So it's extremely evolutionary to begin with. And evolutionary theory plays a huge role in shaping this understanding of, of how the germ and soma are related. Yeah. So one thing he does, actually, um, and it's been a long time since I read this paper by him, but he looked at um, a lower <laughs> animal. <laughs> he uses that term. And he saw that in, in Hydra, um, he saw that there, there, there is maybe evidence that its cells are remaking germ cells, but because it's this lower animal, <laughs> he kind of just uh, decided like to ignore. Uh, yeah. 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 But it's kind of a fundamental flaw there. Hydra doesn't have germ cells. So, yeah, I mean, what is, what is There's the a number of issues. What is the germline in Hydra? Yeah. Yes. My question stems from a, a statement that, that you made, um, that when you take a worm, chop it into a little bit, that it, it can regenerate, but you said regenerate into a new individual. And sort of using that as a springboard, when you take Siona and you are doing point mutations, chopping off the tail, it's reforming the gonads. The DNA in those gonads, because of your point mutations, is now different than the original gonads. So its progeny would be different than the original gonads if you didn't chop it off, correct? Am I positive? Yes, in the most strict version of what you're talking about. Yes. 
they, it would be different because you have introduced mutations in order to follow these cell lineages. The, it sounds like what you're trying to ask about is the boundaries of individuality. No, okay. <laughs> like, I, I don't think we can cover that in the next <laughs> few minutes, and Jane will have a stroke, so let's, let's not try. <laughs> We should take the history of biology regeneration. <laughs> yes, we run a seminar in May. <laughs> Not to advertise. Unfortunately, we're we're running out of time. And yes, you should take history of biology. Matthew <laughs> teaches it on the ground, and Kate is developing an online version that will be available and will address these issues. So look forward to that coming soon. So so let me say thank you. Um, to these guys, and let me, I don't have enough hands, but um, <laughs> on behalf of Karen Ellison and the Li Souls Life Science Ethics Program, we are presenting Thank you sure. with a mug mm -hmm. that you can try to figure out how to get into your suitcase and saying thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>